sort of courageously approach tender-minded topics, emotion, for example. And as you all know, this is a thread of, our, of a lot of our interests today. Um, and he also, uh, you know, did this not only with the science, but he also did it with his patients. And I would say, as I thought about it, I would say that he was amazingly empathic um, with patients and in thinking about things, but he also wasn't afraid to be very straight about things in ways that would be very helpful uh, to patients in sort of a tough-minded kind of way, or a, sort of a tough-minded kind of empathy at times. The other thing about him is that he wasn't afraid to, and even liked to, I think, challenge the conventional dogmas. And um, for all of you that sat around the dinner table with Norm, it would not be unusual to get a provocative question from him about why do you really believe that, or why is that necessarily so? And uh, I think he did this in his scientific work, and he also did it in his own life and his practice. He was, as I mentioned, he was trained as a psychoanalyst. But it wasn't long before he started questioning the dogma of psychoanalysis and asking why you couldn't use other types of more modern treatments integrated with psychoanalysis to get patients better. And probably was seen as somewhat of an outcast, or at least a, a sort of a deserter a little bit, from the standpoint of the sort of the true psychoanalytic approach. But I think that that approach, as long, along with his intellectual curiosity, uh, sort of put him in a position where he had amazing foresight about where things were going in the field. And it was this sort of combination of interest in science and the connection between the mind and the body and the brain um, that really, I think, was his passion and drove him and is another thread that has been very much with us in this department and is, is with the field today. This is a more recent picture, and um, uh, it's one that I actually like a lot. And uh, I thought I would just use this to make some, some further uh, personal reflections. And um, uh, basically to say that, you know, when I came to this department almost 30 years ago now, uh, one of my first experiences was sitting in a seminar about how to listen to patients and talk to patients and develop a therapeutic alliance. And I looked across at this guy, Dr. Greenfield, and I thought, what am I doing here? And I was, thought I was going to go into medicine. I thought I was going to be a doctor, and I'm hearing about all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, it wasn't long before I was actually lying on his couch um, <laughs> as a patient. Um, and uh, I, I, like others, had my own uh, chaos at the time and uh, uh, found the experience of psychotherapy uh, with him over a two-year period as being almost life-changing for me personally and also uh, from the standpoint of giving me a, a new sense of direction and appreciation for the importance of integrating psychosocial interventions with medications and a variety of other types of things. He, um, as I said, I think uh, really uh, loved this department. He put his heart and soul into this department for many years, retired about 15 years ago or so, and still I know that uh, he was very involved at, at many levels in thinking about the field and the department um, and, and things like that. So. So it feels to me that it's a real honor for me to be here, actually, and have been part of this department. And it's been an honor for me to have been mentored and been a very, very close friend of Norm's, as I'm sure many of you all feel as well. And it's also an honor to be here, Marge, with you and with your family um, to celebrate uh, Norm and to think about him and for us all to come together as a community to um, express our love and appreciation. So um, <clears throat> I'm getting choked up, but anyway. So with, with, that, with that in mind, uh, what I'm going to do now is shift and introduce our speaker. Um, if I can, I'll just get a hold of my, uh, my own emotionality here. <clears throat> so, uh, so when we were thinking about this, uh, uh, what, what I thought would be really nice is if we could um, have a lecture series that uh, embraced the ideals and concepts and passion that Norm had. And it's not that hard for us to do that in this department because, as I said already, a lot of those early concepts are still the mainstay of what we're up to. Um, and uh, one of the themes that he was, was dear to his heart was understanding how psychotherapy as a modality that is effective actually works and how does it work in relation to the body and how does it work in relation to the brain. And we now have technologies today that Norm, uh, if he had them in his day, would, would have loved. Uh, where we can look into the brain, we can measure brain function, and we can actually begin to ask questions about the plasticity of the brain as it may change in relation to people getting better, and ask questions about how can we think about who's going to get better and who's not going to get better. And so the speaker that we've got today, uh, Greg Siegel, um, is a person that has really dedicated his scientific career 
to trying to ask these types of questions and understand these types of issues. Um, Greg is someone that we've gotten to know over the years because we have an annual conference here. And I was saying to somebody when he was in his younger days, and they looked at me and said he's still very young, but um, about 15 years ago, he first came to our, one of our meetings, one of our first meetings, and followed that up with many, many more meetings. And so we got to know him over the years. And uh, he's, he's gone on to Pittsburgh to have a really terrific career. Before that, he trained at Brown University as an undergraduate and then spent some time at Northwestern and then out in California um, and then went to Toronto uh, to do his clinical work and then actually ended up in Pittsburgh for a postdoctoral fellowship and has been on the faculty there as an assistant professor and more recently promoted as an associate professor. The other reason I picked him is I thought that Norm would really like him and um, that's, that's, that's an important part too. So let's, let's give Greg a warm welcome and uh, look forward to hearing from While they're getting set up, thank you so much, Ned, for that really warm introduction and for that description of Dr. Greenfield. I'm actually really, really honored to be giving this presentation. Dr. Greenfield's work was so formative for our field in so many ways. His influence was really, it was broad and deep. Broad in the sense that at the time, way before it was in vogue, he was talking about how to integrate neuroscience and psychotherapy. That's still somewhere down the line for us. He was talking about how to make psychology a rigorous discipline, which is still a work in progress. But his influence didn't stop there. He was writing about how to better train our medical students using modern scientific thinking. We're still doing that through our hospitals. And then he was writing papers like, how should, psycho how should psychologists who are not medical prescribing practitioners approach using medicines in the treatment of mental disorders. And that's a huge hot topic today. So somebody asked me today, he was talking about these questions 25 years ago. In the next 25 years, what do you think the hot topics will be? I think it was what he was talking about and we'll still be working on. Today I want to talk about one specific topic that I really believe might have been dear to um, Dr. Greenfield's heart, and I hope will be interesting to yours as well, which is when we use psychotherapy to treat depression, what about our patients are we actually treating? What's getting better, and maybe what isn't? If we know something about the biological mechanisms of depression, we can say, are they being treated? Or for some of the patients who aren't getting better, is it because maybe we're not treating the mechanisms? And if you believe me that we've got some cachet there, the question is, so if we put these brain scans in the hands of our psychotherapists, everyday psychotherapists, would it make a difference? And it's an experiment we've been doing in Pittsburgh. We've been putting brain scans in the hands of everyday psychotherapists who were not